Hello everyone, Dr. David Perlmutter here. <laughs> Welcome. I'm not sure what we're calling this. Another episode in, I guess, coronavirus update number five. Lots to talk about today. We'll be looking at uh, what I've learned about zinc and also about vitamin D supplementation and specifically a lot of questions that we've been getting from people with sarcoidosis, should they take vitamin D or not. Uh, what we've seen happen in the past day has again been kind of on target with respect to the uh, increased numbers of cases and really an emphasis now on we having to do our own work in terms of isolating ourselves. We're not really seeing that as much isolation is being imposed on us uh, as ha it, we have seen in other countries like China. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci did indicate to us today that the idea of a mandatory travel restriction within the United States is something that he is considering and I think that would be, uh, in my opinion, a, a really good move. Uh, we know that uh, we can help reduce the spread if we reduce our contact with uh, one another. And, you know, despite all the sporting events being canceled, etc., uh, we still see that people are out and about uh, not really taking this very seriously. I want to uh, tell you guys uh, uh, about a lesson I learned today. And um, I went to the health food store, you know, with my hand sanitizer, and, and there were a few things that I wanted to get. Fortunately, locally, there uh, you know, were still some things at the health food store. And uh, as a matter of fact, I went early. I was there was only one other person in the whole store. As I was checking out, the um, woman at the cash register, I said, "Could you put a little bit of this on your hands, if you don't mind, since you're handling all the the groceries?" And she said, "Sure, but I use this, and it's actually much better." And I asked her what it was, and she said, "Oh, it's colloidal silver." And uh, I I don't know of any data indicating that colloidal silver is uh, effective against coronavirus. So I said. I asked the question, is there any evidence, do you have any, any thoughts that that's effective against coronavirus? And I basically had my head handed to me and I said, you know, you are 100% right. I completely apologize for asking you that question. And I'm realizing that, uh, you know, there's some almost partisanship happening now between people who are wanting to understand what is about to happen or what is happening uh, certainly it's underway, and others who maybe would like to believe that uh, it isn't. And I want to be as respectful as I can for those who um, are of the mind set that nothing important is going on here. I choose to believe that this is uh, something that's very important, which is why I'm getting together with all of you every single day at 5 p.m. Eastern to have a chat um, to give you the information as I see it. One of the things that you're going to hear from me, and you've heard from me not infrequently, is an answer to questions saying, I don't know. And the truth of the matter is that there are uh, things going on with this coronavirus that uh, nobody seems to fully understand. And that said, uh, uh, that's an answer you may hear from me from time to time. Having said that, if anybody knows uh, out there in uh, Facebook Live Land, how to do a screen share at this point now that I'm up and running. I'd love to know it because I would love to uh, show you some uh, graphs and things that I have. Uh, no, that doesn't do it. Anyhow, I'd love to be able to show you some of the graphs that I've been using, looking at, that allow me uh, to have some of the data that I've been sharing with you. So let's just jump right in and look at... Um, uh, some of the recent data as it relates, uh, but I think what I want to focus on are not the raw numbers because I think everybody knows websites where you can go and hear the latest news in terms of the number of people that are affected globally, uh, nationally, in your state, maybe in your communities, as well as death rates. That's uh, certainly something everybody I think is aware of. Probably not great to focus on that, although you know the rate that these things are increasing I think is very important. Nonetheless, let me just reiterate that for whatever reason, women seem to be uh, less uh, involved in terms of death rates uh, in comparison to men. Men uh, make up uh, about uh, two-thirds of the deaths uh, in this uh, current experience. Why that is, I think we speculated the other day, but I think it's valuable to know that. Um, the other thing I want to talk about uh, are risk of death as it relates to underlying diseases. 
by far and away the most uh, commonly discussed uh, risk factor for death is having underlying cardiovascular disease uh, and that may include hypertension uh, so the death rate all cases of people who have died was about um, 10.5 percent that includes people who are suspected of having coronavirus but in people who have confirmed con coronavirus not something that's happening that uh, frequently in america because of the lack of testing uh, that death rate with underlying cardiovascular disease is about 13.2 percent diabetes 9.2 percent chronic respiratory disease eight percent risk of dying hypertension 8.4 percent I'll come back to that in a moment, a history of cancer, or I'm not sure if that's ongoing cancer. Uh, they're talking about pre-existing, so that would be uh, probably ongoing, 7.6%. Now, I want to talk about hypertension, because in our time together yesterday, we talked about the virus binding to this specific receptor called an angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 receptor. That's how the virus binds to your cells. Uh, these receptors are vigorously represented in lung tissue, but also in the gastrointestinal system as well. Get terrible, uh, can get terrible respiratory issues with this virus, but beyond that, some gastrointestinal things, which are somewhat unusual, uh, at least in comparison to having the flu, nausea, vomiting, and even diarrhea. Uh, so that's the binding on this receptor site, uh, your, the cellular receptor site called the uh, ACE2 receptor. And the question has been asked by many, well, would I be uh, better off if I was taking an, uh, an ACE, an angiotensin converting enzyme receptor blocking medicine, which happened to be used uh, for hypertension. And it looks like people who are taking these medications have no reduced risk. So it's a, an interesting thought, uh, but that said, uh, nonetheless, it doesn't look like that is what the data is going to tell us. I'm going to give you the first of many links at this time. Uh, this is a link of a YouTube video that I'd like you to take a look at. And this is a YouTube video that's really quite interesting uh, because it shows exactly how the virus hijacks our cells to do its dirty work and how it not only is damaging to that cell but then uses the cellular machinery to replicate itself so that it can then infect the rest of your body. It's interesting and a little spooky but certainly interesting. I'd like you to take a look at that because it, it factors nicely into our, the next part of our conversation which has to do with uh, the question of zinc. Now what I've been saying uh, is that the, uh, you know, the data on zinc is, is certainly not out yet. But um, what we have talked about is that zinc seems to be effective with respect to rhinoviruses. Those are the viruses that, viruses that cause the common cold. Uh, that said, however, there is some evidence now that zinc in vitro, meaning in the petri dish, this is not necessarily in the human, uh, and it'll be somewhat explained by the uh, video that I'd like you to watch, but even more so, I think, by the study that I'm about to send you. So there is some evidence that at least in the Petri dish, and again, that's not within humans, hasn't been tried, that zinc may very well be effective in reducing the replication of the um, RNA, the single-stranded RNA that is characteristic of this virus. So my opinion has changed. There's not a trial here that I can quote. Uh, I have uh, gone back to zinc. Uh, I'm taking at least 50 milligrams a day. You should check with your health care provider in terms of the dosage of, the, of zinc that you should take. Uh, I've also seen some very interesting stuff uh, today, some scientific data about Moringa. Moringa is, uh, we actually have a tree that grows in the backyard, but we bought some nonetheless because of its ability, not only with respect to keeping the lungs healthy, but moreover, its ability to reduce inflammation. It turns out that the inflammation part of the story may be what is most damaging in many people. It has been called the cytokine storm, whereby our immune systems produce this huge abundance of cytokines, which are the, men, uh, the mediators of inflammation, if you will. We explored uh, the cytokine storm quite aggressively way back when uh, Ebola was uh, front and center. We were uh, confronted with that. Uh, it doesn't mean, though, that taking anti-inflammatory drugs like steroids, for example, would be necessarily a good idea, though I'm certain that there are some protocols that are looking at that. 
Now, with respect to the remdesivir antiviral uh, and the notion of uh, novel ideas for uh, immunization, i.e. vaccination, I would refer you to our time together yesterday. That would be our uh, number uh, four of these updates because I went into that data uh, at great length. Um, I want to, uh, I've been asked quite a bit uh, in the questions and I'll get to them as soon as I can. Um, I've been asked quite a bit in the question section of our time together about should uh, individuals with sarcoidosis be taking supplemental vitamin D. Now generally the teaching is that people with sarcoid because they can have higher levels of serum calcium should avoid supplemental vitamin C. That's been the teaching for, you know, for a long time. But I'm going to just uh, post to you now a report from the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research that really calls that notion into question uh, in that they are finding that, uh, or they report, that low levels of vitamin D seem to be related with worse disease activity as it relates to sarcoidosis. And I'll read from the report. Therefore, it could be a potential risk factor for disease activity of sarcoidosis. Thus, as these, these authors state, vitamin D deficient sarcoidosis patients should be supplemented. Uh, I'm going to send you the link. Of course, that's something you would want to discuss with your healthcare provider. Now, this is on the heels of our discussion yesterday uh, with respect to how um, vitamin D enhances or upregulates the production of antimicrobial peptides, or AMPs, that have antiviral and antibacterial activity. I am taking 10,000 units a day. You should check with your healthcare provider to determine what might be the right dosage for you. It is time, according to Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, for us to really be very, very serious about our personal efforts to isolate ourselves. What does that mean? It means staying in your home. Uh, it means not having people in, despite the fact that the, the get-together was scheduled you know, several weeks ago and it's somebody's birthday. Uh, it's time to really limit person-to-person uh, -person interaction as best you can. Are you being antisocial? Yes, that's the whole idea. Also important that I mention that this disaster experience is not a one-off. It's not like a bad uh, earthquake in Alaska. It's not like a hurricane that hits your town or a tornado. Uh, nor is it like 9-11. We were all quite nervous after 9-11, rightfully so. But as the days went by, we picked up our lives and moved on. Uh, this is not one of those one-off events. This is an event or an experience that I think we have to all recognize that we're going to be uh, involved with for weeks to months uh, to possibly even a, a year or more. So we have to pace ourselves for the long race here and not the sprint. And that means that you've got to, uh, in my opinion, take those words to heed uh, or heed the words because it means paying stricter attention to basic lifestyle things that help you deal with anxiety, help you calm down. And uh, there is a tendency, uh, according to the New York Times today, more in males than females to be checking the latest statistics as they relate to the coronavirus and that people uh, who are more frequent uh, checkers of these statistics uh, are more fearful of contracting this disease. Uh, maybe that's true, but I do think there is value and I think what the uh, article was talking about and that is back off a bit, uh, concentrate more on the day-to-day -day, uh, things that you should be doing uh, in terms of preparation, but also make uh, extra effort to keep yourself centered. It means getting enough sleep, it means getting outside, breathing fresh air, there's no reason you can't go for a walk, keep your distance from other people, and certainly uh, daily meditation is really important. Uh, we want to do what we can to reconnect to the prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain that allows us to be more measured in our day-to-day decision-making and helping to distance ourselves from fear. When we become deeply entrenched in fear, we become much more impulsive and we don't make good decisions. It's not easy. I know that it's not easy. It isn't easy for me. Um, I, you guys know, uh, 
I have a lot of people that uh, I talk to, including each and every one of you, and um, I take that as a responsibility. I know what's going on. Um, believe me, I, and with respect to my family as well, doing the best that I can in terms of being balanced and making good recommendations uh, so that we can get through this. Uh, we think up to 70% of people, uh, or as Angela Merkel, believe, Merkel believes, maybe two-thirds of people, so 67% of people are going to get this. Uh, you know what? Do what we can to be in that magic 30%. And, uh, but that may require kind of a long-term um, moment uh, that we, we come to grips with how uh, extensive this is going to be and how disruptive it's going to be. Another interesting New York Times uh, article today said, um, no gain, no pain, and no short, we have to endure some short-term pain in other words, disruption of our lives if we want to have long-term gain. And that sort of gets to this notion of flattening the curve. And just to review what that means, if a certain number of people are going to require acute hospitalization, acute care, and even ventilatory support, if we can drag that number out over a longer period of time, there'll be much more survivability. Uh, we'll be much more able to deal with them as opposed to having a very sharp uh, peak increase right now that will clearly uh, overwhelm the system. Um, I am going to start uh, taking some questions. Um, I, I hope you guys understand that I can. That I can. Uh, there were 96,000 of you that watched this yesterday, and uh, I don't know how many questions there were. I think 700. So I'm going to do what I can. Um, okay. Uh, good. Here we go. Uh, elderberry. I keep getting asked a lot about that. I will research elderberry. Uh, thus far, I haven't seen anything that is too compelling. I can't imagine it's going to hurt. Uh, Moringa. I did study today, and I think Moringa tea might well be something to consider. Uh, somebody, uh, Heather, is saying that uh, elderberry may make it worse. Again, let me do the best I can. Uh, that'll be on, ta on uh, tap for tomorrow. Um, Yes, yeah, so I did mention sarcoidosis as it relates to vitamin D3. I uh, uh, have to have high levels of vitamin uh, D3, uh, says Helena. Well, I, you know, a lot of people, most Americans are low in D, having levels of 15 to 20 to 25. And uh, there's been some discussion lately that maybe you don't want to get your levels too high. I think in this case, uh, I don't, I'm not going to obviously know what my levels are, but I'm going to push my dosage a bit. The problem is the global, uh, yes, the global vitamin D deficiency. I'm, a very, I'm very surprised neither CDC nor World Health uh, touched on the subject. Okay, we're touching on the subject. What can I tell you? A uh, lot about elderberry. My goodness, we will uh, try to make some sense of that. I promise and not be judgmental. How many IU should I take of vitamin D? Don't know, uh, Melody, what uh, your situation is, uh, your body size, how, what... Uh, your genome looks like in terms of your vitamin D receptor morphology. I'm taking 10,000 units a day. I've never in my clinical practice, never seen a case of vitamin D toxicity. I know it's described in the medical literature. I never saw it in medical school, but I think it would be um, certainly a discussion to have with your care provider. Pick up the phone. Best to ask your doctor. Good, Sonia, you said that and I would agree with you. What is your opinion of chloroquine and zinc treatment combo for treatment? So chloroquine uh, is being looked at anti-malarial along with a, uh, an anti-HIV uh, in a combination with an anti-HIV combination, in other words, two drugs there plus chloroquine, uh, is being used, my understanding, in China. Uh, I don't know of the results uh, as yet, uh, but I know that it is apparently being uh, used fairly aggressively. So that is something we're going to watch quite closely. Uh, I think there's been some discussion in our country about that. Um, I think this uh, plasma, harvesting plasma from people who've recovered uh, from coronavirus and possibly administering that uh, to those who are suffering might well prove to be uh, very valuable. I mean, that, that is, uh, you know, a research that goes back to the Spanish flu in 1918. It wasn't, you know, as purified plasma as obviously we're able to do uh, uh, these days. And, um, okay, let's go back to questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my husband works an airline transferring baggage. How does the virus live on cloth suitcases? Well, uh, we know it's uh, porous surfaces like um, 
cardboard, which is, I guess, as close as I can get, uh, can keep the virus or allow the virus to uh, remain viable in terms of infective infectivity for 40, as long as 48 hours. Uh, I might review that data with you guys in just a moment in terms of the surfaces. Uh, but that said, um, I think that for people who are traveling, for whatever reason that you think you have to travel, I would do the, uh, I wouldn't check a bag uh, if I were you. Uh, and uh, if you did, then by all means, when you receive your bag, you should certainly uh, wipe it down before you, at the handle especially, before you carry it off. Many people handle the bags, putting them on the plane, taking them off the plane, putting them on the, the belt, etc. And we don't know of the health of those individuals. Are they coughing into their gloved hand or not? So my advice is consider a, a, a bag in the overhead, wipe that down. Who knows how clean the overhead compartments are? Um, right, and you guys can replay this video uh, all you like when it's done. So, And I know that a lot of people have been sharing these videos on their Facebook sites. If you feel there's value here, then by all means, go for it. Do that. Um, another comment about colloidal silver. I don't see any data that is necessarily compelling about that. So um, that said, uh, if people find some data on colloidal silver that is peer-reviewed and has merit, by all means, post it in the comments and we'll share that uh, information as well. Uh, a lot of talks interesting about, uh, and Janelle I'm talking to you about, NRF2 activation. That is an activation of a pathway within our bodies that is involved in many things, one of which is certainly calming down inflammation. That uh, pathway can be activated by um, sulforaphane that we would get from broccoli sprouts, for example. Uh, get some broccoli seeds. You can chew those as well. Uh, you can eat broccoli. Uh, you can uh, use turmeric, take turmeric supplements. Uh, DHA, which is an omega-3 docosahexaenoic acid found in fish oil, uh, is a, a way of activating the NRF2 pathway. And guess what? You can activate NRF2 by exercising. It helps to calm inflammation, and that may be very important. Um, does it spread through droplets or is it airborne as well? Good question. The answer on the droplets is yes. The answer in, uh, in terms of airborne, meaning it doesn't have to be in a droplet, is um, unknown. Uh, there has been some suggestion that that does happen. Uh, JJ Parks, how about N-acetylcysteine? That would be a, a good precursor a strategy for glutathione. How effective that's going to be right now, I don't know. Can virus spread in local water supply? Should water be boiled before drinking? Uh, I think there's no indication that that is true. Um, most municipal water supplies are sterilized. Uh, how effective that is with respect to uh, the coronavirus is unclear, but you have to think of the dilution factor. If a water municipal water worker were to, and had coronavirus sneeze into the the water, it, it would be diluted so aggressively, it's hard to imagine that would uh, be an issue. On the other hand, if somebody sneezes into a glass of, near your glass of water, obviously that could be uh, quite an issue. Um, okay, um, so let me just take a few more. Uh, uh, I, I'll talk about colloidal silver again if I find any research. If anybody else can uh, find some information about colloidal that you think is valid, I'd be delighted to look at it. Another uh, N-acetylcysteine is taking, uh, is certainly something people are interested. Uh, uh, Many of us are compromised due to a variety of illnesses. We aren't as fortunate uh, as you. I'm not sure referring to me. I understand that many people are compromised with um, underlying illnesses and with respect to not being as fortunate as I am, um, I would say that uh, we're all at risk, and uh, I am 65 years of age, so um, I take it seriously, and uh, uh, I, I certainly understand that uh, some people have underlying medical conditions, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. So I, I, I get the message, and that's why I'm doing exactly what you see me doing. Um, let me take a couple more questions. Thank, thank you. Um, okay. Can you get it again it's recovered? Great question. Um, I've seen a couple of reports that this has occurred. 
That's an unknown. Again, here I am saying I don't know the answer. Uh, it, it, one thing is clear that it is not necessarily true that you get it and it's a, it's a done deal, like chicken pox, that you'll have immunity for years to come. How likely is it that you'll get it again? I don't have an answer for you. It isn't known. There has, has been some discussion that you may get it again, but that it might be less aggressive the second time around. Um, how can you disinfect delivered foods? Great question. Uh, I'm not sure I'd be real keen on having delivered foods. Why? Because you don't, with all due respect, know who has prepared those foods, how their state of health may be. They may be wearing gloves, but they may be coughing or sneezing into the gloves. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I think that whatever you receive at your home, you need to think about that. Uh, even if you're ordering from Amazon or whomever, when you get those cardboard boxes, as the evidence we reviewed yesterday demonstrated, cardboard can uh, keep the virus in a transmissible state for as long as 48 hours. So what do we do? Uh, we have a, a, squir a spray bottle of Lysol, and when the packages arrive, I spray them down, and then I let the Lysol sit and you, you know, there's nothing that I have to open the box for immediately. So I let it alone, let it sit, and then maybe several hours later, open it up. Uh, and I take, I leave it on the front porch. I take out from the inside of the box, whatever it is, and uh, take it out. Um, and then I wash my hands again. And you know, you have to consider that people have uh, packed that box, unless it was packed by a robot. I don't know if there's any way of knowing that. Uh, but if people are packing the box and you received it 24 hours later because of the, the beauty of Amazon Prime, well, that's still within the window of infectivity of the coronavirus. So, yeah, you could say that I'm being overly um, aggressive on this uh, technique. But uh, again, as that one individual mentioned about having an underlying disease, um, I'm at risk by virtue of my age. And we are doing what we can to reduce our risk. Uh, does the virus survive humidity? It's still too early to tell. There is a suggestion that like the influenza virus, high heat and humidity will help to quell the outbreak as it does again with influenza every year. We don't know that yet. Uh, we'll take uh, keep an eye on things and see how that goes. Dr. Prometer, oh, going so fast I can't even see. Uh, oh, I can't read. It's going too quickly. I can scroll back up. Okay. Uh, President now saying tremendous this uh, virus and he didn't know and they have it under control and he was surprised I can't uh, but he likes uh, well so I, I have uh, decided for myself not to engage in the pol on the political part of this things are the way they are we have to act for ourselves my mission is to give as best the best information I can as I see it for each and every one of you uh, things are the way they are um, did he mention uh, frankincense and immunity? I did not mention frankincense yet. Uh, I will take a look at that. Uh, let's see. All right, let me now move to uh, some other information that I think is valuable to post. And, uh, oh, I would, but I, I think I closed that window. Oh, sorry. Uh, anyhow, um, let me do this then. I just want to uh, look at the... Um, uh, the transmission rate, I think that is something that we'd all want to know. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, we talked about this yesterday. It's valuable to tell, talk about it again. That is the incubation rate. So it looks like the average, the mean incubation rate. And let's just talk about why this is important. Let's say somebody wants to come to your house and I want to stay in your house because I'm concerned and let's bunk up together, etc. Well, the average, the mean incubation rate is about 5.5 days. What does that mean? It means that half the people can uh, catch the virus and manifest the symptoms before five and a half days and half the people after five and a half days. So there's nothing magic about that. It looks like uh, almost all of the cases will be manifesting uh, by the time 14 days has been reached. So the reality is that if somebody's going to stay in your home and they've been out to restaurants or traveled in from who knows where, for your own safety, it would be good to keep away from that person, put him or her in a room, 
uh, by themselves for 14 days. That sounds terribly draconian and mean and insensitive, but that's what I'm going to tell you is probably the best recommendation. Uh, because you don't know. People can be totally fine, no fever, no cough, doing great. And then, you know, uh, seven days after they were initially exposed by being who knows where, they come down with it and now they're infective and you've been having contact with that person. So not such a great uh, experience for you. I know, again, it sounds draconian. Now is the time to put measures into place. The, we're only looking at the opening credits here. The movie hasn't started. We're just, you know, sort of uh, looking at the trailer about what this is going to be about. So, you know, the predictions are that between 40 and 70 percent of America will get this virus. Uh, that's certainly nowhere near where we are just yet. So uh, things are coming. I'm going to take a deep breath because there's so much that we can be doing right now. Let me go back to uh, questions, and then I'm going to say goodbye for this evening. Uh, here we go. Okay. Thank you as well, Nicole. Uh, if you have a cold already, are you more or less susceptible to, to the coronavirus? Um, I don't uh, know the answer to that. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, if you have a cold, um, the question might be, how do you know? I mean, there are certain symptoms that are more characteristic of coronavirus, like the gastrointestinal part of the story, uh, the fever that is not so characteristic of having a cold, and uh, it's been said that the runny nose part of the cold may be uh, more common, uh, characteristic of having a common cold versus having uh, coronavirus. But again, look, some people can have this coronavirus and transmit the disease, apparently, without any symptoms whatsoever. Um, okay, uh, let me just see. Uh, let's just see. Uh, Cindy, Dr. Promoter, uh, work and advice, uh, and was not trying to criticize. Okay, directed at uh, Lacey, who thinks it's as simple as keeping the immune system up. So, oh, sorry if it's misconstrued. Not misconstrued by me. You know what, guys? No holds barred, and let's just uh, let's try to remain respectful and not dig our heels in and listen to what people had to say. That is what uh, is so very important. Again, uh, Margaret uh, is talking about the success being uh, reported in China with intravenous uh, vitamin C in hospitals. I don't know about that. I do know that there is a protocol underway, and I do know uh, that we are waiting to see those results. And again, the protocol is um, the protocol is 12.5 grams or 12.5 thousand milligrams given intravenously twice a day for 12 days. I'm not sure how they stumbled upon that dosage, but that is what we are being told. Um, okay, a few other things: coconut oil. I don't know necessarily um, profound antiviral activity, but certainly tastes great. Good sorts of saturated fat and if you're trying to be uh, trying to be keto why that's the way to go Tamiflu helped when I got influenza a last June will it help now uh, that is also an unknown uh, there are some protocols looking at Tamiflu I know it's being used from a research perspective I can't say that I'm going to recommend it right now um, because I can't put my finger on research with respect to coronavirus uh, that said, um, good habit at home uh, in case uh, that study does come out. Um, good, Jill, keep political spin out of it. That's right. That's right. Everybody's saying that. Uh, is there any way to disinfect fresh produce that is eaten raw? I normally wash in salt water, but haven't heard that it will do anything for COVID. Why? Why? That is a great question. Uh, and... Um, we still are getting some fresh produce. We're soaking it in the sink uh, as long as we can, then leaving it out and letting it dry. I'm not real keen on spraying our produce with uh, Clorox or Lysol because uh, I don't really want to eat that stuff. I guess theoretically you could use a very, very light bleach solution momentarily and then, um, and then wash that off. Uh, but it's a really good question. I would say that um, 
leaving it out, though it will wilt, is probably a good idea as well. Uh, yes, I have read that it lasts 48 hours on cardboard. The numbers go way down in a short amount of time, so not be dangerous. Do you feel that's true? Yes, it lasts, uh, according to the uh, research that I reviewed yesterday, it does um, persist, can persist for as long as, uh, I'll give you the reference if you like. Here's the reference uh, from Yale. I will post that now. The reference from Yale states 48 hours it can survive on a cardboard, 24 hours on steel, 8 to 24 hours on copper. But the, I think the biggest concern that the Yale researchers talked about is 72 hours on plastic. 72 hours on your doorbell and whatever else is plastic. Uh, the plastic on the grocery cart or the grocery basket, the plastic on the plastic bags that are being used for your groceries, that's a concern. So um, somebody may bite your head off for this, but I would ask the people packaging your grocery if they couldn't just sterilize their hands. Many of them have hand sterilizers right there. My opinion is it should be uh, alcohol-based, and uh, yeah, that's uh, being proactive. Okay, everybody, uh, I'm going to be back tomorrow, promise, uh, all things uh, being equal, and um, let me answer just a couple more questions here. Uh, Kurdish McPhail asks, what about going to the dentist? It's a great question. I think all dental and uh, medical procedures that are non-emergent or that are uh, things you could postpone, my opinion is that you should do that. Non-essential contact in a medical facility, not necessarily ideal. I was supposed to have uh, something removed from my neck tomorrow. Uh, I have not canceled it yet because they're not open. It's Sunday, but I'm going to cancel it tomorrow. I'll take my chances and uh, uh, okay, Angie, how concerned are you honestly? Honestly, Angie, I am concerned. I am concerned about this. I think it's not only uh, a concern for all of us from a medical perspective, but I think that the disruption and some of the social inferences from that uh, may be something we are going to be surprised by. So I'm concerned. I'm not fearful. Uh, I don't think that's a good place to be. I like having things to do, so I'm in, involving myself with preparing for these podcasts every day and also doing what we need to do around the house to be proactive and to be prepared. Um, I'm hoping in the next few days to be joined by Austin Perlmutter. You know, he's the co-author of Brainwash, and uh, he has uh, some great wisdom as it relates to the things that we can uh, we can do to help keep us from engaging our fear centers and that's always really good advice okay you guys uh love you all and um thanks for listening please share this if you think there's value with as many people as you can you know there's a great thing about the herd mentality if we can pass a certain threshold and get messages out to people realize that they're a part of this this big group that's doing what we need to do so Love you all, and I will be back tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.